Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I'm Charlotte Kramer, a current undergraduate here at Stanford. And we're fortunate to have with us here today Professor Desiree LeBeau and Professor Steve Luby. Um, uh, both from the Stanford School of Medicine as well as the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And they just co-hosted a conference on human health and pollution. And uh, uh, Charlotte, you were at that conference. Uh, what are your takeaways from this conference? Um, yeah, I think it was very interesting to me how the conference was sort of well, centered around pollution, but then also split up into three broader sort of themes of wildfire plastic and then coal plants. And then with this final sort of brainstorm sesh at the end, I think it's good to discretize this problem, talking about human health, because there's so many factors there. And if you don't really look at them differently, like apart from one another, you're not going to get very far. I think the comments on how we quantify the effects of human health also really interested me because we were talking about healthcare expenditure a lot, I think, and how what we're doing to the planet directly causes us to spend more on healthcare. But then I wonder who really pays that cost. Is it like healthcare centers or is it the actual people that are being hurt by this? And how do we quantify that cost? Correctly. Well, that's that's incredibly interesting. So, Desiree, Steve, you came up with this sort of three categories. What led you to that? Well, we were really looking for areas that we thought were high impact and that we thought would excite faculty. So, um, wildfires is something that Stanford has been working on for a while. Clearly, a big environmental problem tied to global warming um, with huge health. Um, um, implications. Similarly, plastic's a very big problem that um, Desiree and others have considerable interest in, and the huge impact of coal-fired uh, plants. So thinking about these three issues as being big enough that we could imagine convening a, a bunch of people around that we would get excited about, that we could fill um, panelists, that we could get lightning talks around. So, um, yeah, so it was something that would help us um, specify pollution and health in ways that people could dig deep on. Yeah, and we, as Steve just mentioned, we really were trying to ignite the Stanford community first and foremost around these solution areas. We had an, an inkling that there were folks out there that we didn't know about that were doing incredible work and making incredible insights in these areas. And we wanted to have an opportunity through the lightning talks and through bringing panelists in both from Stanford and outside Stanford to really have a lot of dialogue across sectors and then really just get to know each other with networking so that we can use this conference as a first step to then have future future steps where we come together to really tackle these really big and important solutions in pollution and health. Well, that's really inspiring. I, you know, obviously, I think everybody knows a little bit about the plastics problem. We've all experienced it, if, if nothing else. Um, and Desiree, that's an, an area you've done work in. What did you learn at this conference that you didn't know about plastic? Wow, it's a huge problem. I mean, I knew it was a big problem through my research and my work, but I I learned a lot about some of the intricacies. Um, there's more and more data coming out now about microplastics and the impact on human health there. That's a huge place to study because we ingest microplastics in everything we eat and drink. Um, we highlighted a little bit some of the One Health impacts of plastics on our planet. So, you know, the plastic crisis is part of the climate crisis, but then also the biodiversity crisis. We talked about that. And just um, the ways that we can really work across different sectors, bringing in policy, litigation. We talked about the UN um, Plastic Treaty, which we have faculty here. And from the outside, we had litigators and, and folks in environmental law come in and, and talk to us about the, the discussions that just went on in Canada about the UN Plastic Treaty. And so I learned a lot about kind of what is happening right now in plastic, where we need to put our scientific mindset to drive policy forward, and how we can work across sectors to come together to solve the crisis. Well, that's really super interesting. Now, Charlotte, you know, taking the student's perspective, 
Yeah, how did you come away from the conference? Are you seeing solutions? Um, I think so, honestly. Uh, I think you two are really amazing in the sense that you want to work with the Stanford community. I felt in a lot of these conferences that we fly people from all over the world, all of the best universities, and then immediately they go back to Oxford or Cambridge or where whatever school they came from. But this, it was very Stanford centric and I could appreciate that as a Stanford student myself because I do want to get involved in these opportunities. And I, I feel that sentiment a lot in the undergraduate body that people want to fix things, especially the youth. So this conference was really cool. And I hope, I hope to see a lot more undergraduates at them in the future. I know we're not as educated as all of you. No PhDs behind our names, but. I don't have a PhD. <laughs> <I fire. laughs> well, and, and we feel strongly that um, human and planetary health is really important um, for Stanford. Mm -hmm. It's important for the Door School to achieve its mission. And it's even important for the university um, to achieve Jane Stanford's view of being a purposeful university. Mm -hmm. So, um, a big advantage of bringing human health into the conversation around sustainability and around environmental sustainability is that for many people, the connection with human health is just more salient. Yeah. They understand it better. So decision makers and all, they're, they're willing to make decisions on human health when they're less willing to do that around something that just feels a little farther away, like biodiversity loss or climate change. So we are super excited that undergraduates are interested. And we were intentionally Stanford-centric because we do want to build the Stanford environment. We're new. We're getting started. And we want to identify some high-value research areas that we might work on going forward. Yeah, this really folds in really nicely with the Human Planetary Health Initiative, soon to be center, where we were really trying to ignite and catalyze and activate a really um, deep and broad Stanford community to tackle some of these problems. And this just seems like a great first step. It's interesting because it's Stanford centric, um, as you all point out, with respect to the researchers. But boy, these topics are global. Yeah. I and mean, I there's think everywhere. That's something that I found very, very difficult to sort of understand at the start of this conference. I, or even this entire series of conference, I feel like we're doing so, so much research. And then what, you know, how does this move from the Stanford Conference Center to rural areas, underserved communities where things are most needed? And I think this is an advantage that um, physicians have and public health practitioners have is physicians are used to making decisions and we're trying to act in the world to make our patients healthier. Well, now our patient is the whole planet and there are communities that are sick. And so, so I think the public health orientation is different from a pure academic orientation, which is we need to publish some more papers to work on this. A public health orientation is very action oriented. And we're even trying to identify not interesting papers to write, interesting questions to answer. We're trying to identify questions that are important, impactful, that if we answer them, we can improve the situation in the world. And so that is part of what is driving us um, with, uh, with each of the projects we do and even each of the panels we put together. And I get it, Charlotte. Like these, these, these problems can sometimes seem daunting, overwhelming, right? And you're thinking, good Lord, like what can I possibly do to help out this massive global crisis, right? In this case, we talked about pollution and health. Well, I'm an optimist and I really believe that we have to do exactly this. We actually have to convene people who are values driven and really want to make a difference, who are bright, innovative thinkers to come together think about what needs to be done and then get their hands dirty. And so it's a convening like this where you start to sow those seeds and those relationships, which are actually the foundation of any movement, right? We're really starting to kind of garden her way through solving this crisis, right? And it's going to start with relationships, trust building, knowing what's out there, knowing what the gaps in research are, trying to find all the partners that need to come to the table to make equitable, really sustainable solutions for these problems, and then figuring out exactly how to go about doing the work. And I think HPH, Human Planetary Health at Stanford, is going to have a real 
um, a real footprint with actually driving forward some of these low hanging fruit solutions that we can and as a community really get our hands dirty with doing. I think just one question for the two of you as sort of health experts looking at our planet as a patient, like what is our planet suffering from? Would you say like if you had to give our planet a diagnosis, like what is the terminal illness? It's suffering from extractive capitalism. From extractive um, uh, fossil fuel technology driven capitalism. Um, and what we need to do is to go is to transcend this um, linear destructive model into a model um, that is more sustainable, that is more indigenous, that is more like um, the donut economics, mm -hmm. where we work to have a um, a just society that meets the needs of individuals and that lives within our ecological limits. That says that as we put private industry and finance together, that their charge is to our institutions is bigger than just, well, we want the stakeholders, the shareholders to make the most money. No, we need to be more intentional about how we use our enormous power so that we can preserve our home. I completely agree. We are a world that is completely out of balance. And, in, and you bring up indigenous values. We tried to, we had um, multiple indigenous speakers on our panels. I actually read some words from Braiding Sweetgrass and Robin Wall Kimmerer at the conference and really talking about, you know, we are living, we are taking a very inharmonious harvest of our earth. It is completely about extraction. We have we have a relationship crisis with our planet. That is like our mother or her source of life. And we have completely used her as a resource and a way to extract. And so we need to come back into reciprocity with our planet to only take what is given to actually feed the world and ourselves and our planet as we move forward in this. Yes. <laughs> you know, it seems like a great example of this uh problem would be one of the three categories you put out, uh, coal. Coal. Nasty. I mean, it generates all this carbon dioxide and global warming. It, it creates all sorts of partially combusted hydrocarbons. So it's not only small particles that you inhale and get deep into your lung. There are even some that are so small that they get absorbed um, into your bloodstream and into your brain, causes all kinds of problems with cardiovascular disease, leading cause, 20% of all heart attacks um, in the U.S. are thought to be due to um, air pollution. Air pollution, you know, kills um, you know, 9 million people. And, so, and these partially combusted hydrocarbons are just, so, are just such a big driver of all this. Coal is just very dangerous. And on the world stage, that must be true as well. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and so... So we need to think about our capacity for creative solutions. And of course, part of that creativity is better technology, better grids, better energy storage. But also part of that um, creativity is how do we work to change policy? How do we work to mobilize folks to think differently? How do we um, affect on the global stage? So, so I, I think you're right. This is, um, this is a huge part of the problem. Um, but we also heard examples of what people are doing that are bringing us, for, um, making some progress in these areas. And we think that there is a real role for continued research engagement. I feel like my issue with all of this is that you say the problem is with the system. So I think why even work within the system? You know, why worry about how much money I'm going to make off of an innovation? Why, why do all of these checks and balances if the system is kind of what's destroying the planet already? And then you get stuck in this idea of, well, if the system's broken and I can only work in the system, what do I do at all? And I feel like that, well, that's definitely my biggest problem. Yeah, so so I would say there's whole there are all kinds of things you can do in the way you change the system. So people think, oh, well, we need to have a revolution. Well, don't we? Um, well, maybe we don't need a revolution. Maybe we need an evolution, and maybe we need to start taking steps that we can take right now, like some of the interventions we've developed in Bangladesh to reduce the um, coal consumption and brick making by 24 percent. Yeah, we're still burning coal but it's 24% less. And there are things that we can do to, and part of what happens when you make those kinds of 
uh, steps forward is that you demonstrate that you can improve the situation and you build social trust. You build social trust and you build trust with policymakers and then you can say, oh, what's the, what's, what's the next thing we can do? Where can we go next? And ultimately, I do think you're right that we need to we need to move from our 19th century models of economics to 21st century models of economics. And, that, and so we need to become 21st century economists. And that includes a recognition that this whole economic system is built upon Mother Earth. And that if, and that, that damage to Mother Earth isn't just an externality, it's only an externality because of the narrow-mindedness of the economic paradigm that has, um, for some reason, persisted for 150 years. So we do need to challenge that paradigm but and but I think it's multiple levels that have to go on because we need to be engaged in the world and actually making those changes you know Steve it's music to my ears that you say this and and um, and this conference and the research papers uh, and this this dialogue is something that uh, seeing it uh, happen here at Stanford makes me so happy uh, Desiree I'm going to turn to you for the last word. Okay, well, I'm going to get back to the revolution. So I think it's an and both. I think it's really unfortunate that we have to stay within these corrupt systems and work within them to dismantle them. But it is sort of a fact of our lives. All our systems are broken and we're stuck in all of them. And so we have to do what we can from being within them to change them. But they're and, and really disrupt the status quo within them as much as we possibly can. But I agree with you. We need a systems resolution in all the ways. I mean, if there's one thing I learned from this conference, and I spoke about it today, it's that all of our systems need to change. What I learned at this conference is that, you know, pollution depends on the systems continuing the status quo. And we need to revolutionize business models, the way businesses work, healthcare works, what our things come in, all the packaging, right? The way that fires are started and, and run, right? All the whole fire community and the career path for fires and how that can transform itself, right? And become more community and citizen owned, right? And then finally with coal, we know that coal is killing us just like we know the fossil fuel industry is killing us, right? And so we have to find a way to transition away from these systems, which are at the foundation of our modern society. But we are smart. We are adaptable. We are an innovative, intelligent species. We know this is the issue. We have alternatives. We need to figure out how to stop subsidizing and funding the old ways of being and come back into the balance with the planet by funding and supporting new ways of being. And that's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us from within the systems and then a complete revolution of business and business models to support that transition. And I think that's what the School of Sustainability is all about and transition in our new Sustainable Societies Institute that's coming up. I think transitioning to this new world is what we all need to see and be a part of. And we can't just leave it for the future generations like you to do it. We need to be doing it too. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Dr. Desiree LeBeau, Dr. Steve Luby, and Charlotte Kramer. And to all of you at home, from me, Bill Barnett, until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.